Uh, thank you very much, Wes. Um, and uh, it is a pleasure as a as co-chair of the Human Rights Interest Group uh, to welcome you, uh, Madam President, uh, to this um, event. Uh, I would like to start saying that uh, it has created a lot of interest uh, within the group and beyond. Uh, in fact, uh, this event is being co-sponsored by several other interest groups, uh, including the Latin America, the Rights of Indigenous People, uh, international organizations, you, uh, women in international law, migration law, and international environmental law. And of course, I would like to thank these groups as well for uh, co-sponsoring this event. And it's a truly honor uh, to have you today as a keynote speaker. On uh, This is the first event uh, of a series in which we are uh, planning to invite. In fact, today we have the confirmation for next month of the, of the head of the president of the African Commission on Human Rights uh, for November 17. And then January, February, when I, I try to have, you know, the, the um, Europe uh, commissioner, and then ideally the high commissioner for the last one, that's uh, Paul. So it's a very good starting um, to have you uh, here. Uh, um, Madame Urejola, President Urejola, grew up in England and graduated from law school in Chile. Uh, I can say that uh, her passion for human rights is also, is not only, it comes from different perspectives, including familiar ones. Uh, she has extensive regional experience, but not only regional experience, but uh, also she has worked at the highest level of the government of Chile implementing human rights. In fact, she worked very close to the, to the then president of Chile and now high commissioner, um, Bachelet. Uh, she was also a principal advisor to the former sec Secretary General of the Organization of American States for six years. She has worked with several international organizations. So uh, that comprehensive background uh, as a human rights defender from different perspectives, it's even uh, more interesting to have you uh, here today. And on its more than 60 years of experience, uh, the commission and the commissioners have transitioned from a part-time schedule in which they will come to DC every two times per year uh, to a full-time schedule. When, and of course, when I mean full-time, it's not nine to six full-time, including even in hours, weekend hours <laughs> uh, every day. And, which includes also not only annual reports, uh, but including annual reports, but also somehow the expectation that the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights would uh, react immediately to human rights issues, uh, including to social media. So uh, that's it's a, a great expectations that civil society states and everyone has uh, from the commission. By the way, a commission when, when it started more than 60 years ago was mostly uh, uh, men. Uh, today, uh, in addition, I mean, the whole board of the commission is comprised uh, by women, the executive secretary, the two also adjunct executive secretaries, uh, women and, and the audience is very interested in your presentation today, uh, Madam President, on, on a more general, let's say, overview of the main uh, current human rights developments and challenges in the region, and also uh, the priorities and work plan of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. So welcome again, uh, Madam President Urejola, the floor is yours. Yeah. Um, good morning and I don't know, good afternoon, good evening. I don't know what, what time it is for everyone, but thank you very much, first of all, for the invitation. Thank you, Ignacio, Wes, James, thank you for this invitation. 
Um, I will try and give a main overview of, of human rights developments, which of course are all um, determined today be, with the impacts of the pandemic, but I will try and go a bit more, further more than the pandemic. Um, um, I, I, I have written something because I think it's easier or else sometimes one gets a bit lost with everything one says. Um, our region has witnessed significant progress in recent decades, particularly since the end of the military dictatorships and the internal armed conflicts in, in the region, including achievements in terms of institutions and public policies with a human rights approach. But beyond these advances, which are many, and we must recognize, it is inevitable to point out that the last year and a half has been unusually hard, not only for the region, but for the whole world. The COVID-19 pandemic has accentuated all the inequalities, vulnerabilities, and situations that violate human rights, leading us to rethink the roles of states, international organizations, civil society, academia, and all different actors in the face of the crisis. Over the past year and a half, our region has been affected by the outbreak and spread of the pandemic and by the responses adopted by states to contain it. Among the mitigation measures, states established mandatory quarantines, curfews, the closure of workplaces and economic activities, the suspension of classes in school systems, the closure of borders, and other measures that, in some cases, had adverse consequences for the protection of human rights, particularly for historically excluded groups and people in situations of special vulnerability, such as women, LGBTI, Afro-descendants, indigenous people, children and adolescents, people with disabilities and elderly, among others. There are also actions with discriminatory impact against migrants, refugees, displaced and stateless persons, as well as the worsening of the conditions of persons deprived of liberty in the region, because conditions such as overcrowding and lack of appropriate hygiene and health measures were exacerbated by the spread of the pandemic. From the beginning of the crisis, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights understood that it was essential to strengthen its institutional capacities for the protection and defense of fundamental freedoms and human rights especially the right to health and other economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights. To this end, it created a coordination and timely and integrated response room, we call it SACROI in Spanish, with the following objectives, objectives, to monitor the response actions taken by states in the region, identify urgent cases within the system of petitions and cases, and precautionary measures to provide a timely act attention to these um, different petitions and precautionary measures, to propose to the Inter-American Commission actions in relation to member states with a view to the effective protection and defense of human rights in the context of the COVID-19, identify opportunities to provide technical assistance for the development of policies and actions by states with a human rights approach, follow up on its recommendations, conduct outreach and capacity building activities to states but also to civil society, which is very important also, and to deepen dialogue and coordination with specialized international organization on human rights, civil society, among others. Among the most important contributions of the SACROI was the approval of the resolution 12020 last year on pandemic and human rights in the Americas. This resolution was a comprehensive approach by the commission to the pandemic situation in which it reflected the standards of the inter-American human rights system and formulated a set of recommendations to member states to address the fight against COVID-19 from a human rights approach. The resolution called to OAS member states to adopt a human rights-based approach across the board in any state strategy, policy or measure aimed at addressing the COVID-19 pandemic and its consequences, which must be in compliance with the inter-American and international human rights standards. The recommendations included in the resolution called on the states of the region to provide and apply intersectional perspectives and pay special attention to the needs and differentiated impact of measures on the human rights of groups that have been historically discriminated against or are particularly vulnerable, 
such as older people, persons de deprived of liberty, women, indigenous people, children and adolescents, LGBTI groups, Afro-descendants and persons with disabilities. After this resolution I just mentioned, and in response of the evolution of the pandemic in July 2020, the Commission adopted a new resolution, Resolution 4 2020, regarding human rights of persons with COVID-19. And it established each American guidelines for the rights of these people, people that have the, the, the COVID. In the framework of the resolution, the committee noted that since the onset of the global health emergency, efforts in the Americas to hold the virus and this disease started to affect the, the, the context of the pre-pandemic context, which includes discrimination, poverty, inequality, structural weakness of public health systems, and in many, many cases, the lack of political and institutional stability. As a result, the population of the different countries in the region have been and continue to be extremely affected by the pandemic. People with COVID-19 are at particular risk of not having the human rights, particularly the right to life and to health, ensured through the adequate provision of health or medical facilities, goods and services. This resolution provided a set of guidelines for the implementation of actions aimed at the protection of the right to health of persons with COVID-19, including aspects on the rights to consent in health matters, equality and non-discrimination, privacy and the use of data, access to information, protection of other economic, social, cultural and environmental rights, and access to justice. The resolution also recommended to prioritize the right of life to the people with COVID-19 in the public policies, the provision of resources and cooperation, the protection of the rights in relation to the intervention of private actors, the protection of the rights of health and care workers also, as well as the rights of the family of members of victims killed by the COVID-19. This resolution, Resolution 4 2020, talks about the right to mourn, to mourn for the for the families of the victims. This is especially important in indigenous people and indigenous communities. After that resolution in the following months, the commission understood that unequal access to vaccines required the implementation of efforts from international cooperation and the development of public policies, again, with a human rights approach. And in order to contribute in this regard, we adopted resolution 121 on COVID-19 vaccines in the framework of the Inter-American Human Rights Obligations. This resolution looked to respond to the urgency of ensuring a rapid immunization in the Americas in an equitable manner, as well as for states to, pl to place public health and human rights at the center of their decisions and policies on COVID-19 vaccines. And of course, non-discrimination when distributing the vaccines, which has been a problem in many countries. In addition to these resolutions over the past year and a half, the Commission has also published numerous press releases, social media positions on the impacts of the pandemic on different vulnerable groups, held regular forums for dialogue with states and civil society, carried out various promotional activities and developed in innovative resources such as practical guides to offer tools to the inter-American community to address this crisis on, a different, on the different issues. Um, in, in our report of the 2020, our annual report, marked of course by the COVID-19 pandemic and the measures implemented by states to address its spread and mitigate its effects, and through the monitoring we have been doing through this, this year, 2021, we have identified a set of human rights trends and challenges in the region. First of all, regarding social protest. The Commission has noted with concern the illegitimate restrictions and the excessive use of force in social protests in some countries of the region. In accordance with inter-American standards, in the context of social protests, states must ensure that their security forces have different types of weapons, ammunition, and protective equipment that allow them to adapt their reaction in a proportional way to the situation that requires their intervention, generating adequate and effective safeguards against arbitrariness. 
In this context, the Commission warns of the widespread use of the so-called less lethal weapons in social protests by various police forces in the region. And we have warned, warned of the extremely serious consequences that their disproportionate use can have for personal integrity and even life. In this regard, the Commission underscores the obligation of state officials to observe at all times the principles of legality, absolute necessity, and proportionality. The Inter-American Commission recalls that the actions of some individuals during demonstrations do not disallow the right of assembly for demonstrators who observe a peaceful and unarmed nature. States have the duty to protect the exercise of the right of assembly and freedom of expression of demonstrators. And they have the duty, sorry, to identify and isolate those who interfere with its full exercise. It's a state obligation to, to address the people that are doing violent demonstrations, but it's not the obligation of the demonstrators to do that. The Inter-American Commission calls on states to respect and guarantee the exercise of human rights by strengthening democratic and particip participation of citizen security policies that are focused on the protection of human rights. In addition, the Commission has received information on detentions, the use of physical violence, the use of firearms and weapons that are, concern, are considered less lethal against persons who allegedly contravene the epidemic control measures. In this regard, states must avoid arbitrary detentions during restrictions on the movement of persons, and all detentions must be subject to the, to the due judicial control in accordance with human rights standards. The Inter-American Commission notes with concern certain trends in the context marked by the pandemic caused by COVID-19 virus, which point to illegitimate restrictions and the excessive use of police and military force in the area of citizen security in some states of the region in demonstrations and social, social protests that have resulted in deaths, serious injuries and arbitrary detention against demonstrators and third parties that are not even involved in the protest. In addition, the Commission has noted the persistence of acts of violence and discrimination against groups in special situations of exclusion, such as women and girls and LGBTI persons, indigenous people, human rights defenders, social leaders, Afro-descendants, which have been exacerbated in the context of the pandemic. The situation of persons in human mobility and persons deprived of their liberty is also of great concern. Older people are also at extreme risk of infection with the COVID-19 virus. The prevalence of mortality, especially last year, from the virus in people aged between 65 and 74 years is eight times higher than people aged 40 to 49. This risk has been included in long-stay institutions where the elderly reside. In this regard, the Inter-American Commission has noted with particular concern the high prevalence of infections and deaths in residences for this population. In addition, the isolation to which all the people have been subjected in several countries in the region is of great concern given the particular need of this population to connect with their families. The impact on the mental health is of great concern also for the Commission. With regard to human rights defenders, the Commission has noted the persistence of high numbers of murders and assassinations of human rights defenders and social leaders in the region. Attacks, threats, harassment, acts of intimidation, criminalization, stigmatization campaigns, and the, the delegitimization de de of their work. The Inter-American Commission notes that the aggravated risk faced by human rights defenders and indigenous uh, people, the land and, and defenders of land and environmental issues, women rights defenders and leaders, as well as a high level of impunities in these cases of assassination or threats. Likewise, patterns of violence against journalists and the media continue to be verified, as well as the persistent climate of impunity in crimes and violence against journalists reported the previous years. The Commission once again calls on the states of the region to take concrete, adequate and effective measures in the areas of protection, prevention, investigation, and access to justice in order to create an enabling and safe environment 
For those who defend human rights in the region, this is a, a special matter that the Commission is very, very worried, and we share this, this concern with the, the Office of the High Commissioner. In relation to the rights of Indigenous people, the Commission has received information on the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, in particular, the shortcomings in medical care with multi multicultural approach, delays in the state response to care for these populations, and the lack of consultation and consent in relation to prevent and mitigate the policies. The Commission has also noted with concern the high levels of violence against women in the region, which has been aggravated by the policies of confinement implemented in the context of the pandemic, as well as persistent challenges in access to sexual and reproductive health services. Many of these services were closed during the pandemic, which has an impact on the rights to social and sexual to sexual and reproductive rights that women have. It also we also have taken note of the measures adopted by the states to strengthen care and complaint mechanisms for women victims of domestic violence. The information we have during the last year is that at least a thousand one thousand four hundred women have been assassinated in in the context of of um, uh, family violence. And, uh, and this is something that is very serious in the region. I'm just talking about official um, statistics. Of course, the, there must be um, much more. With respect to LBTTI persons or people that perceive themselves as such, the commission has observed high levels of violence, including hate crimes against them because of their sexual orientation, gender expression and or identity or sexual characteristics. The Commission has been particularly concerned about the existence in several Caribbean countries of laws that criminalize consensual, consensual sexual relations between adults of the same sex, called sodomy laws or laws on serious, serious indecency, as well as the persistence of so-called conversion therapies or efforts to correct sexual orientation and or gender identity of LGBT persons or those perceived as such. With respect to the rights of persons in human mobility, the Commission has noted with concern the impact that the measures adopted by the states to contain the spread of the phenomenon have had on the protection and guarantee of the rights of these group of persons. In particular, the Commission has noted the persistence of immigration deter detention practices, accelerated expansion or deportation procedures, a decrease in resett resettlement actions for refugees, limitations on entry into the territories of the states and obstacles to present the right to asylum or protection application or to the continuation of those procedures, restrictions on the access to public services, the closing of borders to groups of migrants returning to their own states of origin or nationality, the forced displacement of persons inside the countries and acts of serious xenophobia. The Commission stressed that migratory phenomena, whether for economic reasons or a political reasons, require a priority approach by states based on the principles of solidarity, cooperation, and shared responsibility in the context of the pandemic, with a focus on guaranteeing access to protection mechanisms and ensuring non refoulement for persons whose lives and integrity are at risk. In this regard, the Commission has welcomed the efforts made by some states in the region to adopt measures to guarantee access to healthcare for migrants, to facilitate the continuity of administrative migration and protection procedures, such as extended deadlines, humanitarian aid services through the delivery of food, and the implementation of humanitarian flights to repatriate persons to their countries. The Commission has also monitored the serious consequences of prison overcrowding for the life, integrity and health of persons deprived of liberty in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. This situation has a greater impact on persons belonging to vulnerable groups such as the elderly and those with chronic or autoimmune diseases. In this context, countries in the region have adopted various measures to prevent and spread the virus, mainly by reducing the prison population. In this regard, two main types of initiatives have been implemented. Those that seek to apply alternative measures to imprisonment and those that seek to commute sentences through pardons and amnesties. Despite these, initi these initiatives, 
the situation of persons deprived of liberty in the region in the context of the pandemic is one of the Commission's main concerns as it places them at a particular risk of contagion and were appropriate of not having adequate medical care to treat COVID-19. During 2021, like I stated before, the Commission has been specially monitoring the access to the vaccination, COVID-19 vaccination, noting that it constitutes a particularly key challenge to overcoming the pandemic in the region and in the whole world. Approximately a year and a half after the start of the pandemic and nine months after the start of, of vaccines, the Commission is concerned about the disproportionate impact the pandemic has had in the Americas, along with the existing obstacles to universal and equitable access to vaccines, especially for low and middle income countries, as well for certain groups in situations of historical vulnerability and exclusion. The Commission has already underscored on several occasions that in the framework of the inter-American obligations, vaccines are a global and regional public good, which requires not only concrete measures to ensure that they, they reach all people under the principle of equality and non-discrimination, but also to ensure the equity is a key component for their distribution, not only within the countries, but also between countries, rich countries, have vaccination, poor countries don't have vaccination. Um, for the, from the beginning of the immunization campaigns against COVID-19, the Commission understood that unequal access to vaccines required the implementation of efforts for international cooperation and the development of public policies with a human rights approach. That is why we did this resolution that I mentioned before. Another issue that we are very worried about, which is not related to the pandemic is the democratic instability. The crisis generated by the pandemic has also made it clear that despite the progress made in terms of democratic and human rights institutions in recent decades, and the enormous impact the inter-American system has had on these issues, democratic instability continues to be a threat that cannot be ignored. It is necessary to continue working tirelessly to generate human rights institutions within countries that are robust, autonomous and independent, essential ele elements in a democratic society. Also during this year, the Commission and its Office of Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression, we have expressed our concerns regar regarding the guarantee of freedom of expression in on the internet. This is another relevant issue in the current context, as the internet is a platform and a means to exercise human rights, such as freedom of expression, political participation, education and economic, social and cultural rights, among others. But it is also an instru instrument that is contributing to this information. The Commission believes that the hemisphere is at a turning point characterized by a generalized deterioration of the public debate. In this sense, those who engage in the base of general interest participate in a public space that they are also called upon to protect. While the exchange of arguments and the public exposure of disagreements enriches the debate, violence and hate speech erode the democratic system. One of the inevitable challenges is to build consensus in a participatory manner to help establish clear criteria in accordance with human rights standards so that the moderation of content on the internet is in line with the aspirations of open democracies with, a, with plural voices, media platforms and opportunities. These criteria should respond to the need for clarity and, spe and, and specify the restrictions, ensure non-discrimination and consider the importance to, to regulate the, the, the um, um, private enterprises also. The bodies of the inter-American human rights system have an important role to play in this task, but also private enterprises have an important role in this. Another issue is corruption. Undoubtedly, one lesson that the pandemic has taught us is that efforts to confront the pandemic have had better results in those countries where the population has confidence in their authorities. And that trust is based, among other factors, on access to information and transparency in decision-making. At this point, I would like to reiterate the importance of developing and implementing public policies to consolidate a comprehensive anti-corruption strategy with a human rights approach and to ensure the existence of mechanisms for accountability and access to justice 
in the face of possible human rights violations, including abuses by private actors and acts of corruption or state capture to the detriment of human rights. Finally, another issue of concern for the Commission are measures that affect the principle of separation of powers and the judicial independence of the organs of justice in the region. During this year, the Commission has warned that some legislative amendments to existing regulations carried out in an expeditious manner and without consultation with the bodies directly affected by them could impact the administration of justice and the right to judicial protection of individuals, as well as the rights and guarantees of justice operators in several countries of the region. This is something that is is being very worrying for the for the Commission, the independence of judicial uh, bodies and, and, and other organs, independent organs that have to regulate and serve as counterparts of the decisions that the executive make. I would like to uh, address a few more issues because the um, the the my speech was supposed to talk about also about the work of the Commission, and I would like to, to mention some things regarding the uh, strategic plan. The Commission has a strategic plan 2017-2021 that was built through a broad participatory process that led to identify the relevant issues and effective proposals that should be carried out by the, by the, the Human Rights Commission to address the challenges of human rights issues in the Americas. This plan has five strategic objectives, 21 work programs, and at the moment we are evaluating the impacts of that plan because we're ending 2021. And it is very important to evaluate the impacts of that plan to again address the future plan we're going to work on. And that future plan, no doubt at all, will have um, um, a thread regarding the impacts of the pandemic on human rights. And since we're, we're talking to many people that work on human rights issues, it is very important to tell you that we're going to do a, a public consultation regarding the future plan. And the more people that participate uh, in this uh, public consultation, the more representative our, our next plan will be to address the challenges that the Commission has in the Americas for the next four years. Um, and one of one of the things also that the Commission has been working through um, in the last few years is to to the, reduce the delay. We have a backlog on the system of petition and cases. We have been working on that backlog. We have we have carried out um, historic um, reports in the last year or so, but still we have an issue there. How to how to face the backlog we have on the system of petition and cases, even though we have been addressing. Um, this issue, and I think we are on the right track. The Commission has to continue addressing the backlog with the different um, measures we have already taken. I don't want to 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 um, to address the different um, percentage of cases we have, but it is a problem we have in the inter-American system, a structural problem that I think that the measures we have taken in the last few years no doubt at all are on the right track and we have to continue working on that because it's the only way we can ensure the victim of the Americas access to the inter-American system. Um, with a backlog, uh, people that do not get justice in their, in their own countries seek for justice in the inter-American system. And if we don't address the backlog, um, we will be re-victimizing the people in, in the Americas. That is why this is priority for the commission. I, I think we are on the right track, but we have to continue working on, on those issues. And of course, we continue working on, on, on um, precautionary measures, which unfortunately uh, are also something that has been, um, be, has, has been in, the, in the work of the Commission, especially this year. We have received more um, petitions on precautionary measures than the years before, and that is um, like a, a thermometer of, of the human rights situation in the region, especially regarding human rights defenders. Um, we are working very hard so to, to, to listen to the different petitioners on these cases and to work with the states to give protection to those people, but this is another issue that we are very worried about in the actual context. And finally, we continue working on the, the permanent monitoring that we do on the situation on human rights. 
Um, we have been, we, this year, well, with the pandemic, we haven't been able to do many visits, unfortunately, but we did a visit to Colombia, for example, to verify on the ground the situation of the country in the context of the social protest that began in 2021. We have been doing virtual working visits, for example, to, to Dominican Republic and to Mexico regarding um, human rights um, the violence and discrimination against women and, and girls, and also persons in context of human mobility. Um, we have been also working on, on country reports. This year we, we, we launched a, a report on the human rights situation in Brazil, a report on economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights of people of African descendant. We have practical guides on the internet and human rights, migration, unity, and family reunification in the country from the pandemic. Um, we have done a compendium on memory, truth, and justice uh, regarding inter-American standards. And also right now we did a publication regarding the, the, hum the rights and the risks, I mean, the risks of human rights defenders in the, in the Northern Triangle. Um, and right now we are also working on a thematic report regarding human rights and pandemia in the region which will, we're trying to, to, to integrate all the work we have been doing in the last one and a half years. So we have a thematic report focused on the, on the, on the impact of the pandemic on human rights, the challenges the states have, but also we must address the challenges that the, in, the, in, the Inter-American Commission and all international organizations have with the pandemic. The pandemic has not only affected human rights issues, it has affected governance for the states and also it has affected the work of the of the um, organizations that uh, international organizations and the commission is one of them and also we have to address the challenges we have right now and how we have to to respond to this new context respond to new working systems be more creative on how to address a human rights crisis and be and and be there at the right moment and at the same time how we can address um capacity building with states especially because of the impact on the uh, um economic impact the, the pandemic is going to have and is having in the different countries and the impact that has at the same time on human rights and how we can work with states um it is very important states violate human rights, but states have also the role to protect human rights. So the commission has to denounce the violation of human rights, but at the same time, I think a challenge is how we work with the different states on a common agenda, especially because of the challenges the pandemic is leaving all of us, academia, civil society groups, organizations, uh, international organizations, and states and governments as a whole. And we have to work together on those issues too. Um, I think I will be ending here my 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 intervention. I just think we have to we we I think the the, the if we talk about the working plan of the Commission for the following years, um, I want to stress out the importance of the strategic plan we are working on, the importance that we have the participation of the different actors and and different stakeholders. But at the same time, um, we we have to, as a commission, we have to see our mechanisms to be more flexible to respond to the new challenges. And I think that is something we all have to face and adapt to this new context, which is here to stay for a long time. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President, uh, for your fantastic uh, presentation, which we could hear from you uh, first, the, the mention of some advances of the human rights uh, in the region over the last decades, let's say. And then uh, all you know, the main challenges that the commission sees, and including you know, the, the, all the situation related to COVID-19, uh, the vaccines, the impact on especially vulnerable groups, as on the other hand, social protests, the situation of human rights defenders, indigenous people, uh, rights of women, uh, migrants, people in prison, democracy, freedom of expression, and internet corruption work, and, and the, work, the work of the commission in relation to all these situations. So in this brief presentation, it's great because we could have, you know, uh, 
an excellent overview that was precisely the, 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 the idea of these events. It's you know, how the commission see the, the situation in the region. And then you know, we have uh, 15 minutes left. I know that you are in the middle of the period of sessions of the, of the, of the commissions. So as a moderator, I will allow myself to, to, to suggest a few topics so that you can, you know, in, uh, 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 Madam President, you can choose which ones would you like to, 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 to address. Uh, and this is just a, a suggestion of some specific uh, matters or things. Uh, one is the situation in Nicaragua. Uh, elections with all you know the, the possible uh, candidates but one in prison. Good, uh, the, 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 recent, the recent visit of the commission, uh, part of the commission yourself to, Col to Colombia in the context of, of, of the, after you know, these protests that have been, uh, which was a very important, had a lot of repercussions that, that, that visit, that you're, you're also the, the rapporteur for Colombia. On the other hand, Venezuela is a challenge for many years for, 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 for the commission uh, and, and somehow was an, an represented probably, you know, one, an example of, of the new, of the new uh, institutional challenges in which some governments get elected democratically. And then afterwards, uh, somehow the, the features of democracy are weakened over time uh, to, to the point that maybe a point in which they disappear or, or they, but anyhow. Uh, also the right to choose, we have seen in the hemisphere um, interesting situations in which Countries have advanced, have passed laws on the subject, and other countries that have been an example for, for, the, for the rest of the countries are somehow at least in some states going back. Uh, so it, this is, of course, that's a, 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 a notable situation of advancing and, 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 and going back and forward for different countries. And the, and the other one would be, you know, environmental law and climate change. Uh, you know, how the commission is, is, is working on, on, on that uh, subject. And, and finally, on a more somehow, you allow us, um, Madam President, a more like somehow personal level to ask you in your four years at the commission, uh, you mentioned one of the highest, of the biggest challenges that you have seen. And also one of the you know, uh, success or one of the, the, the rewarding experiences that you have had as a human rights defender at the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, well, first of all, regarding um, Nicaragua, um, the commission at the moment is working on a, on, a, on a report that we hope we will be launching at the end of next week. Um, focused on on civil rights and judicial independence, we are very worried about um, the, the future elections, which will be now in the sense of November. Um, as I suppose everybody knows, in the last few months there has been uh, persecution against any leaders of the opposition. And when I talk about leaders, I always like to stress out: it's not only leaders, political leaders. Um, of the opposition as such, but also we have um, we have journalists that have been imprisoned, um, human rights defenders, feminists um, that have been imprisoned, and and any 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 leadership, social, human rights, political, even um, from the private leaders from the private sector that have been imprisoned, any voice of dissent that could have a, a political leadership um, has been imprisoned. We have we have um, Christiana Chamorro, the daughter of Violeta Chamorro, who, who expressed uh, her interest in being a candidate for the presidency. We have her brother, who is a who who is a um, um, 
a businessman. We have the director of La Prensa, a very important paper, Nicaragua, a historical, very important um, paper. Um, we have um, Tamara Davila, she's a human rights defender, a, woman, a feminist human rights defender that um, that um, advocates for sexual and reproductive rights. We have Dora Maria Telles, who was the um, commander in chief with Ortega in the fight against um, um, Somoza. So I'm talking about I, I just mentioned a few names because that shows you that these are different people with different backgrounds, with different histories, personal histories, and but also with different political views. They're not all right wing to put it in, you know, left and right. Um, and some of them are just human rights defenders. And all of these people have been imprisoned, more than 30 of them in the last few months. And we have uh, more than 100 political prisons before this situation. Um, the commission has been monitoring the situation on human rights very closely since 2018. And we have been permanently denouncing how, how there, has, there has been a, a repression. First of all, it was the repression on, on the protest with more than 328 um, people killed during the protests, mainly during 2018, where the, there was a disproportionate use of force with um, paramilitaries um, on the on the on the roofs um, that that use their weapons to kill. Uh, there's a number of, of of cases where they were the bullets impacted the head of the thorax. I mean, it wasn't trying you know to disperse the population; it was to disperse the protest, but to kill them. But after that situation, what we started to see was how the leaders, most of them were, were leaders of, of the universities, started to be criminalized and they were imprisoned. Um, and then we started to see how the NGOs were the the um, they were cancelled, the legal personality was cancelled. Then we started to see how um independent press also were confiscated. The, the buildings, the, the machinery started to be confiscated by the states. So this has been um, uh, different phases, a more violent phase at the beginning, which was much more seen by the international community, but, but the repression has not stopped. It, it has been, they, all public um, spaces have been closed little by little and today we have a, sta a police state um, before these last imprisonments of these leaders, what they had already told us is that if they went out of their houses, they were all, always followed, whether they went to the doctor, whether they went to the supermarket, they were always followed. Some, some of them could not even leave their houses, which is before they were imprisoned. So, I mean, this is not a new situation. It's just gotten worse because now we have elections in November uh, and now the, the um, there has been a special criminalization against these people that have a more public face. Um, and the situation is very worrisome. Uh, as I say, we have a we have a we do not have a state to a rule of law in Nicaragua. There is no independence at all. The judicial body responds to the executive. The public de um, defenders respond to the 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 executive. The the Congress responds to the to the executive. The almost person responds to the executive. There's nowhere to go. There is nowhere to go. There is no state of law right now, and there is no spaces for pluralism and, and public debates. And, and journalists that are still in Nicaragua, independent journalists, think it twice before they denounce anything because they are being imprisoned or they are being exiled or, or they're being threatened. So it's a very worry, worrying situation. And uh, I hope the report we will be launching next, next week will help that the international community can respond um, in a country that needs the, that needs the international community. Um, I would end up there. I can talk about Nicaragua like an hour, so I will end up there, but I think it's very important that the international community and the different stakeholders of the international community are very alert on the situation in Nicaragua and help to denounce and to, to help to replicate the voices of the people that are in Nicaragua. Regarding Colombia, um, well, Colombia has been a priority for the commission. We, we have the, the peace agreements. Um, Colombia is a very complex country because of the um, 
uh, armed conflict, the internal armed conflict that has been taken for so many years um, with the peace agreements. There's a there was a there's a hope, a, a light in, in the road, but it's not easy. The implementation of the peace agreement in a country that still has um, um, different paramilitary groups um, um, and also illegal armed groups. We still have um, um, uh, narcotrafico, um, drug 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 trafficking. Drug trafficking, and um, and those different groups that fight among themselves are in the territories. It's a huge country, um, and they take over some of these territories. So a lot of um, human rights defenders, environmental defenders, indigenous group defenders are threatened by these different groups, and they're in the middle, in the middle of the military that try to take control of the of the land. But at the same time, of these illegal armed groups and. You have um, Afro-descendant groups um, and um, campesinos and, and pheasants, and also indigenous groups that are in the middle of of, the, of this armed conflict that still continues. Not that it used to be, but it still continues. And in all this context, um, there was a, a, a huge um, protest in different um, cities of Colombia in the middle of the year because of a, a tax regulation that the president announced. And um, and those protests were in different cities uh, and that ended uh, in the use of disproportionate, disproportionate um, force by the police with a lot of the, of the protesters killed or injured with um, eyes lost. And, uh, we had a lot of... Um, um, information of of disappearance, uh, people that were taken by police or, or unidentified persons, and those people are still disappeared. Some of those people that have, have been disappeared have appeared dead in the latest months or so. Um, a lot of reports on sexual violence, um, uh, human rights defenders and women that were protesting um, when taken by the police were, were abused by the police. Um, um, and also reports, and this is one thing that, that was for me, mo impacted me the most, when we met, we met with the president, we met with, um, with the Congress, the different parties, we met with um, the private sector, and of course we met with the victims, NGOs and human rights defenders. And there was one thing that everybody denounced, all of them felt stigmatized in, in, in the social media. The president was being called um, a, an international criminal and, and a lot of, of um, members of the parliament um, being threatened and had to leave their cities or take their families out of their cities. Human rights defenders, on the other hand, the same situation. Um, my, my, that's, the mo that's, that's what most impacted me when we talk about the stigmatis the, the use of the internet to stigmatis stigmatize the other person, to, to threaten the other person. In Colombia, for me, it's an, a, an example because uh, in a, there's no in a political debate at the same time you have the debate on 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 the on the on social media that is um a, a hate speech and all of these different actors felt stigmatized and i think that is an, that is something that that is really um f for me personally it impact, impacted me because in a sense what what one saw is is that that the way that the Colombians um, have seen this this crisis, which is a social protest, but the, the way they are discussing it is the same way they have been discuss discussing the armed conflict. Um, there's something there that has not changed, even besides the the peace agreements that are very important. But the way the Colombians um, discuss. The, the differences, there's something there that I see has not yet changed, which is maybe cultural and might may, may take time. And, and the other issue in Colombia that at the same time we saw the, uh, 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 the violence of the police and all these situations of disappearance, um, um, vi uh, sexual vi 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 violence from the police. At the same time, we did see something that has been um, 
a lot of discussion inside the commission and with the government and different actors in Colombia. And I think it's not only in Colombia, is the use of, of protests that end up being violent. And where are the limits of the right to, to protest? And what are the limits to the violence that occurs after that? And the first of all, the obligation of the state to, to, to guarantee the protesters, protesters the right to, de to, ha to have manifestations and to demonstrate and the, their obligation to isolate um, the people that are being the violent protesters. Um, but in Colombia, this is something a bit more complex and especially in some cities. And um, again, uh, I think this is something we have seen uh, in the last few years in different countries that um, the use of violence in, in the middle of the protests and how 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 the, the inter-American system has to address that too, which is a, a difficult challenge, I must say. And, and then another issue we saw in Colombia, which we saw also in Nicaragua, was the the the, the route uh, the routes the roads that were cut, the bloqueos they call them in Colombia, the bloqueos, and how they can affect other human rights. And um, that was another issue. Uh, issue. Um, some people in Colombia wanted the commission to say that the cutting a route, cutting a road, was against the right to protest. And of course, we do not. We 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 see that that's a way people can um, protest. But at the same time, what where are the limits? If you have a city that has that all the roads to to go inside the city or to leave the city have been cut, and no medication get get in or out the city, or no um, a, a, a basic a basic things such as. Um, things to eat and that is what we also saw in Colombia so I think Colombia um, is very complex I think the situation the human rights defender situation uh, every day every day and I am not exaggerating when every day we have information of some social leader human rights defenders that have been killed in Colombia um, but the context is very complex and I think Colombia is something that also the, the international community has to pay closer attention with the complexity it has with it, its history on the, on all these elements I have um, just um, said. Um, regarding Venezuela, um, that's another issue that is very difficult, of course. Um, as you know, Venezuela uh, denounced the, the, the OAS charter, so now they are not part of the OAS. Um, they're not member of the OAS. Uh, um, but the Commission continues to monitor the, the situation and the human rights situation in, in Venezuela. We continue to give precautionary measures. We continue with the petitions and cases. And we have a special mechanism to do follow up on the situation on Venezuela, um, where again, like Nicaragua, um, <laughs> more complex, I think, Venezuela, there is no rule of law. And also um, the economic and social rights um, is something that uh, with the pandemic we have seen um, and that has been the structural problems they already had before the pandemic now is much more worse. And the, 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 the Venezuelan migrants that have left Venezuela for political or economical reasons that have have been um, expelled from the countries that received them. Um, and our call again for the solidarity of the international community regarding the Venezuelan um, refugees. Um, regarding climate change, that is another issue that we have been addressing in, in the late later years. It's not something we have historically worked on, but right now the commission is working on a resolution on climate change and the impacts on human rights. We are especially worried about the effects of climate change in Central America and Caribbean countries. Um, those are the most affected uh, economically on tourism and displacement because most of the, of the cities are on the borders of the sea. And with the high levels of the sea, they ha people have to displace themselves to go to, to the inlands with, with all the effects that means. So we're working on a resolution on that. We hope to have that resolution at the end of this year. And, um, um, you asked me about my biggest challenges on the four years I have been a uh, commissioner. I wouldn't say on one country. I think for me, 
well, Nicaragua for me was, has been a great challenge just because I had just started being a commissioner when the crisis started in Nicaragua. It was my first um, country visit um, in a very complex context, very polarized context. And I was new in the commission. So I think it was like a, I was baptized there <laughs> and it was quite brutal. And I think in Nicaragua, that's why I think I, I have, I, I, I am so, um, um, I feel like a personal commitment with Nicaragua, maybe because with Nicaragua, when I went the first time, I was with a lot of students that were were um, protesting on the streets, very afraid, but continued protesting. And the second time I went, I visited the um, jail and I asked, um, the first time I went, I, I was with some medical students, some girls that were medical students that were helping the injured because um, and the ho public hospitals denied the attention of the injured. So the students of medicine organized themselves to attend the injured. And I was with a group of girls that, that had been um, attending the injured. And they, when I went the first time, they were very afraid because they were being threatened by the mayor of the city where they lived. Um, we met in a church because they were very afraid. And the second time I went, um, I went to, to the jail and um, I asked for them to open one door. It was, you know, like, uh, it's not because I knew who was there. I just said, please open this door. I want to see who's there. And it was these girls, the same girls I had seen the months before. And they were imprisoned. And I think that for me was... Um, a really, uh, it was an impact because I had seen them free, saying they were very afraid, and then I saw them imprisoned. Uh, and some of these girls afterwards um, were liberated, and I met them again free in Miami. So in a sense, I've been, it's like a personal relationship, and one of them is imprisoned again. So I think um, when you have like, you start to see, um, that all we have been monitoring um, when I when I talk about the different context, um, I have the names, I have the faces, I have the voices, and I think that's an impact. And also the visit to El Salvador with um, the mothers of the of 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 the children that that have been that were kidnapped kidnapped by the military in the middle of the armed conflict. I, I was with a mother whose five children were kidnapped by the military until today. She doesn't know whether they are alive or, or not. 30 years have passed, 30 years. Uh, and in that, in that sense, I think um, what I have, I have with me always is that the work of the commission has an impact, in, has a, a structural impact the recommendations have st structural impacts in the countries, which uh, um, the reparations and um, all the work we do with the public, um, with the press releases, with our reports. And I think that is a very important impact. But was what I take with me as a challenge and at the same time, what rewards me the most is that I think the, the commission is also um, um, a space where we listen to those voices that are not heard. I always talk about that, where, we, where, where commissioners can listen to people that have never, ever had anybody to listen to them. And that is something that is not always um, um, read in books. Um, it's an impact you cannot calculate. There's no indicators to see that impact. But for me, those are the, that, those are the main challenges that we continue being a, a safe space to listen to those voices that have not been heard, listened to, and at the same time, um, the the what is rewarding are that those spaces, I think, are re very um, reparatory for the victims, even though they don't get justice, you know, that it is tangible. Um, to be listened by to the commission, to be to feel um, that they are being heard, that the the claims of justice somebody is listening to them i think is also rewarding and you and and, and you I, I see that when i am with the victims and i think that's the most rewarding thing also madam president thank you very much I don't have enough words uh, to thank you uh, for that extraordinary uh, presentation uh, also i think that i will uh, why do you represent our more than 70, 150 people in the human rights interest group uh, all over the world to invite you formally 
to consider joining us. It would be you know, fantastic for us to, to have you as a, as a member of, of, of the group. I've allowed to say a lot to contribute and, and, and that, would, that would be fantastic. Thank you very much for you, for the, for the audience, and also, of course, for the groups that co-sponsored this event. And we will circulate the invitation for the next one that you also invited, Madam President, to the one on the African system a month yeah. approximately from now. Well, no, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. I am honored. So yes, of course, I would love to. So thank you very much. And thank you very much for listening to me. And good luck with, the, with your further conversations. Thank you very much.